Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and welcome to worship at the Presbyterian Church in Morristown. We are so pleased this morning to have our Presbytery leader, the Reverend Jean Raddick, with us to preach the Word of God for us this morning. And we hope that you are well wherever you find yourselves here as we finish off the summer. And so let us now prepare our hearts and minds to worship God and join together in our responsive call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord and call on God's name. We will sing praises to God and tell of all God's wonderful works. Seek the Lord's presence continually. Seek God's strength. We remember all that the Lord has done for us and rejoice in God's steadfast love. Let us worship the Lord with gladness. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us join together in our unison prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have tried to hide from you, for we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and refused to bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. Blind us with the light of your truth and grace. Free us from our past and open us to a future grounded in your ways and filled with your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Hear the good news. As people born of water and the Spirit, we have died to the old life, and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. In, In Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ we, we are, are forgiven. forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. in you Jesus you're all you're all you're all that we need your power will pull us through we're trusting in you we're trusting in you you give us hope and life that's forever you make us bold and we stand together
this journey there's no looking back With Jesus to lead us we're on the right track Oh, 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 oh. Wide open spaces for wide open eyes We're looking ahead for the next big surprise Oh, 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 oh. We trust, we trust, we trust in you Please join me in our unison prayer for illumination. Pour out your Holy Spirit, O God, and prepare our hearts to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading for today is Exodus chapter 14, verses 15 through 31. Then the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. But you lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. Then I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And so I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots and his chariot drivers. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained glory for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his chariot drivers. The angel of God who was going before the Israel army moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there in the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into a dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of the Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon the chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. 
as the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground to the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Our New Testament reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 9, the first 19 verses. Listen now for the word of God. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found anyone who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? And the reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him, Ananias, and he answered, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and for the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house and he laid his hands on Saul and he said, Brother Saul, the Lord who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up, was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Recently, someone lamented that as the fall approached, we believed that we all would be somewhere normal or near normal by the time we got to Labor Day. But yet, as we enter into this fall season, we are not anywhere near where we imagined or hoped we would be when we started this pandemic. We are still in the midst of a pandemic. We are in a transition. We are in chaos or craziness or whatever words you use to describe life right now, it feels like there is no light at the end of the tunnel. There is no sense of an end and maybe no feeling of moving forward in our journey. The Reverend Susan Beaumont, author and church consultant in her recent book called How to Lead When You Don't Know Where You're Going, names this experience as a liminal season, or a liminal space, or even a liminal experience. That is that liminal space or liminal experience is that place where you feel stuck at the threshold 
between an ending and the start of a new beginning. Liminal seasons are those times and places where we feel like we can see where we're going, but not quite. It's like a fog. We can see a pattern or something familiar, but not really. It's a place of bewilderment, a place of wonder, anxiety, awe, creativity, and fear all at the same time. Our Old Testament scripture is the story of Exodus, and it's the wandering in the wilderness. And liminal experiences as have often been described as wandering, but, but not knowing where you're going. Now, any story of the Exodus uh, would have worked to illustrate a liminality or a liminal experience, but I picked the crossing of the Red Sea. The Hebrews had left something very familiar. Uh, it may not have been a satisfactory thing they left, but in a sense, uh, it was still familiar. And they left in a hurry to go to the promised land. Now they didn't know where they were going. And at first the journey was very joyful and jubilant and celebratory. They were excited that they were finally leaving Egypt, but then the reality set in that the Egyptian army was following them, and then there was chaos and panic and a sense of loss of direction. So God directed Moses to a particular place, and there Moses parted the Red Sea, and the Hebrews crossed over leaving the Egyptian army to drown or to be separated from them by the water. And when the Hebrews got to the other side, they entered a liminal season. They did not know where they were going, nor how, how to get through there or where they even were, and nor could they turn back. And we all know the story. We know that they wandered for 40 years. Our second reading is also about a liminal season. Saul, soon to be called Paul, was on the road to Damascus when he saw an extremely bright light and, and he falls to the ground and he hears a voice questioning his evil and bad behavior. He finds that he is blind. He, did, he didn't know what had happened and the voice told him to get up and go to the city and to wait. So what was that about? There was a voice out of nowhere. They heard it, his companions heard it. They didn't see the light. And this voice says, go to the city and wait. And that was the beginning of Paul's liminal experience. He was at the end of one thing and told to wait for the beginning of the next. His beginning of his liminal season was very quick and very dramatic. Now, Ananias, a disciple living in Damascus, was told in a vision to go to this man and to lay hands on him. And he was even given a very specific address to where to go. Ananias knew this guy and he argued, this is not a good idea. Yet, he goes, not knowing what will happen or if he will come home. So Paul and Ananias find themselves in a place they did not know or did not understand. It was not by choice, and it was very quick, very dramatic. And the future, the next steps, were very unclear. For Paul, this was a literal darkness. For Ananias, there was uncertainty. For both, they had heard the call of the Lord to something new. And with that call, there is that sense that some sort of light, some sort of way out of the season of uncertainty and fear, but they did not know 
and they did not choose to be there. Since March, the church, our communities, our families, ourselves are living in a liminal season. We do not know how long this is going to last. We do not know how to get out of it. And for this congregation, it is a multi-layered liminal experience by adding that now there is a search for a new pastor. So often I've been asked, what do we need to do to move through this time of uncertainty? Well, processes and protocols are not the paths out of the liminal season. There are no checklists, there are no best practices, there are no playbooks on how to find our way out. Liminal experiences mean you do not know how to journey through the season. We can, however, look to our Bible stories, our biblical stories, as, as possibly some guides. And what we learn from those uh, readings today is that we have options. One option is we can wander in the liminal wilderness as a community seeking what the world will be on the other side of the transition and the pandemic. Or another option is we can grab hold of an opportunity and answer God's call to something new, something different, scary and exciting and definitely unknown. Both are options. If we choose to wander and dwell in the wilderness, in the liminal wilderness, let's do it with purpose. Do it with an open mind and heart that something new will emerge. See it as an opportunity that God is setting something before you. And remember, the Hebrews had great difficulty in the wilderness. They had difficulty letting go of the past. They had, they had difficulty for they were fearful. And that probably kept them wandering in the wilderness a little longer. So do it with purpose. Let go of the past and try some new things. The other option is to view the liminal season as God's call to something new, a new opportunity to discover, uh, to discern, to new openings that God has set before us. And embrace them. Embrace them like Paul and Ananias. They did not want to be where they were. They recognized that this call was a dramatic call to action. And even though they didn't want to be there, they answered the call and they moved towards action. The other option is to fight with the liminal season, to fight with the liminality of the world today. It's to deny it, to sort of try to checklist our way out of it, hang on to those things that we we try to say are tried and true, cling to our history or to our traditions or to the hope that things will not have changed when we get to the other side. Beaumont shares that during the liminal season when we find ourselves as a community in a liminal place, there are elements of the journey that sustain us and help us to shape and dwell in the experience until we find the other side. And the elements are hold steady. Don't go chasing after every little shiny object. Tend to the community. And as she says, don't just tend to the community, tend to the soul of the community. Seek and discover and discern what God is up to. What is God's call to us in this time and place? Shape memory and history by sharing our true stories, not the ones that make us look and feel good, 
but the stories that truly shape the life of the community. Clarify purpose. Clarify the purpose in this time and place. Not the purpose that was six months ago, but the purpose that we are in now. And last, engage with the emergence because we will come out, but we'll come out in a different place. Don't wait to let it happen. Engage in where we are going. In this liminal season, in this time of fog and uncertainty, the community has options. You can wait and do nothing and, and wait until the fog has lifted. You can wander in the wilderness seeking and learning where God is leading. Or you can answer God's call to something new and different and creative. For all the glory is God's. Amen. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, because we are often not strong enough to pray as we should, you have given us Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit to intercede for us in power. In this confidence, we ask you to accept our prayers. Empower the church throughout the world in its life and witness. Break down the barriers that divide, that united in your truth and love, the church may confess your name, share one baptism, sit together at one table, and serve you in one common ministry. We pray particularly for the ministry of the Presbyterian Church in Morristown, that it may do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly before you, so that our community would seek to bring an end to the systems that oppress your people. The systemic racism would be met with sweeping change that honors the lives of people of color, seeking to repair the breach that has plagued our country since its founding that those who are persecuted for the way that they pray, the people that they love, and the ways that they seek to express themselves as fearfully and wonderfully made creatures might find support, justice, peace, and above all, the love of Christ and his church. We thank you for the ministry of David and Ann Smazik, and we thank you for sending us Ed Halderson to help shepherd us in this time of transition. Creator of all, you have tr entrusted the earth to us, yet we disrupt its peace with violence and corrupt its purity with our greed. Prevent your people from ravaging creation that coming generations may inherit lands brimming with life. Make us more cognizant of the resources that we have and how we use them so that we might work towards a more perfect world in the age to come. Sovereign God, from the streets of Portland, to the streets of Kenosha, to the Morristown Green, may your justice flow down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. We see so much in our world that is not right, that is not inspired by love, that does not seek to edify all of your children. Our hearts ache with grief over the lives lost through the senseless killing of our brothers and sisters particularly those who are targeted and violently taken from us because the color of their skin. May words of protest not fall upon deaf ears, God, as we pray for you to open our hearts, our minds, and our ears to the cries of those around us. May your peace flood a nation embroiled in division, anger, and a sense of self-preservation that engenders xenophobia, patriarchy, and white supremacy. Fix us, Jesus, for our home on high. Oh, fix us. We pray for our President Donald, our Governor Philip, our Mayor Timothy, and all others who create and enforce the laws and policies of this land. In the days that lead up to our election, may you move in the hearts of your people as they consider whom they should vote for to lead us in the future. 
We ask that you would unite our country in justice and liberty that seeks the freedom and equity of all people. We pray for those who have suffered loss this week, particularly for the family of Carl Cronin, a longtime member of this church, that you would wrap your arms around his family and that they may know that you are with them. We pray for those who are suffering with illness, for those who are suffering with COVID-19, for those who continue to endure the way that that disease has raged their bodies. We pray for healthcare workers, for EMTs, nurses, and doctors, even within our congregation, who put themselves in harm's way each day as they seek to bring healing and comfort to our world. May you guide scientific minds with creativity and imagination that seeks to treat this global pandemic. And may medical advances be made that offer an antidote to COVID-19. We pray for the mental and emotional health of all of those around us, that you may quell the anxiety and panic that can paralyze minds and bodies. May depression be met with encouragement and empathy. And may we all be strengthened by your love and saving power. We pray for those who have been affected by the hurricanes that have decimated areas of the Gulf. May communities like ours respond to the need of our brothers and sisters whose lives have been swallowed up into the waves. God of glory, you see how all creation groans in labor as it awaits redemption. As we work for and await your new creation, we trust that you will answer our prayers with grace and fulfill your promise that all things work together for good for those who love you. And as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. in the places you find yourself. No God is with you. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>